This is the Prestigious Initiative. Welcome. I'm Chris Bean, and here with me is Chris Kent. Hello, Mr. Kent. Hello, sir. Welcome back to the Prestigious Initiative. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on effective communication. In this episode, we're going to tackle the topic that is crucial to both person and personal and professional settings, and that is conflict resolution. Join us as we delve into the strategies and techniques to handle conflicts with grace and empathy. So, of course, conflict is a natural part of human interactions. One person says this or thinks this, the other person's going to be thinking or, or, or saying the exact opposite of that. It's always a challenge to navigate those situations. There are many different types of conflicts and underlying causes. You know, you could have a, a disagreement at work, you have a, a, an, an argument with your, with your spouse or with your partner. You know, there's so many different variables at play in a conflict. So understanding the root of whatever the conflict is that you're battling at the moment is essential to finding a meaningful resolution, a, a meaningful resolution that is also beneficial to both parties or all par- parties that are involved. And I'm glad that we're including this in our conversation about uh, effective communication because as we all know, I think when you get into these situations, the last thing you're thinking about is how to tactfully and how best to get out of them. I think sometimes when we're in conflict, the only thing we're thinking about is being right or getting the upper hand. And so discussing this now and going over kind of the ways that we can work through a conflict, things that are important to keep in mind when you're in a conflict and ultimately trying to resolve the conflict in a way that is beneficial for everyone is important. And, you know, maybe this will be something we should go back to and refer to, or maybe we can kind of, you know, break this down into simple steps afterward so that when you're in those moments or we are in those moments, it's easier to kind of find a way out of them because we have that roadmap or, or as you really like Mr. Bean, a, a system to kind of work your way out of it. And, you know, as much as we can kind of break it down into a step-by-step process, of course, it isn't as simple as that. And so just this first step here and understanding the root of conflicts seems like a simple enough thing, but it isn't always easy because of emotions and difficulties in communication or stressful environments and stressful situations. And so, again, I think it's, it's great that we're going over this to kind of have an idea of how to navigate them. But then we're also saying all of this, understanding that things don't exactly go from point A to point B or in these conflicts and we don't see things the same way within a conflict. And it's not always easy to remain a good communicator when we're in these tough situations. You know, and, and trying to understand that root cause is tough. And I know a, a co- perhaps a counterintuitive approach uh, that I've heard that debate teams use is instead of them debating the argument that they want, the, the, the easy argument for them, they're forced to do the other side, the side that they don't necessarily agree with. Because what that does is that gives them the foundations to understand where that other person is coming from. And to me, that is essentially getting to the root cause of whatever that argument is. And so I, I understand you can't do that in everyday situations. But uh, I thought that was really interesting that a debate tactic is to come at it from your opposing viewpoint, like try to argue on behalf of the person you're arguing against, maybe not as you're arguing or debating with them, obviously, but just to understand that root cause from their perspective. I, again, I thought that was really interesting and perhaps counter, at least for me, I didn't think that was the right way to go, but absolutely after I kind of thought through that and, and see that, I, yeah, okay, if I have to argue this point from their side, then that would give me a better understanding of where that person is coming from which is really interesting, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. And in those situations too, you're kind of being forced into an open-minded perspective where you have to kind of figure out how someone else sees something, not only to figure out how they see it, understand how they see it, but then argue how they see it, you know? And so I like that approach. I like that idea. Unfortunately, sometimes we're in a conflict we don't have the time to prepare for in that kind of way. So uh, what do you think are some ways that we can still try to find out the root cause even after we're already in a conflict and and try to resolve that from within a conflict. What do you think? Well, you know, I think that active listening is, you know, is a powerful tool 
in conflict resolution to truly listen to that person's perspective without interrupting or judging. Let them say what they have to say. Under, do your best to understand and really listen to what they're saying. You know, active listening can foster an understanding and open pathways for resolutions. Remember, with active listening, we want to listen to what the other person is saying and then rephrase it back to them to just to be sure that everybody, both you and that other person or the team of people, whoever, are all on the same page. So I think active listening would be, you know, the first step in that process. And thinking about active listening within the realm of conflict, too, I, I, you know, as much as we can sit back and listen and not interrupt, um, rephrase what someone said, I think a few key things to the act of listening within conflict is, like you said, number one is not to judge. And number two, really try to understand their perspective. You know, if we're in a conflict and you're saying something that's completely, I think is completely ridiculous, but because we're in the conflict and we are in the conflict because you wholeheartedly believe what you're saying, I'm never going to get to a point where we can resolve our conflict by holding on to that idea that what you think or what you're saying is completely ridiculous. And so not only listening to what you're saying, but really trying to understand what it means to you or how it is that you feel that way or, or your side of that story too. And, and really to perceive and, and listen to that person's perspective, I think is huge, especially within conflict, because I can sit there and listen to what you're saying and rephrase it back to you. And I'm not saying you have to believe someone in a conflict right away off the bat necessarily, but really try to understand where they're coming from and take them seriously when you're in that conflict. I think that's, you know, goes in line with active listening, but it's an important step there. You know, don't just listen, but really try to understand what they're saying so that you can have a meaningful conversation, hopefully out of the conflict, but, you know, have a conversation to get your way out of the conflict. But then what you're doing there too is trying to find out the root cause because if I don't understand what you're trying to tell me, I'm never going to understand why you're upset and we're never going to be able to resolve that conflict. And so I think it's a important part of active listening within those conflict conflicts is, you know, listening and, and hear what they're saying and not judging and really trying to understand their perspective so you can figure out, again, starting off with the root cause. We can try to figure that out by putting our biases aside and really just listening and listening with, with intent. And without even even realizing it, in that practice of active listening and then rephrasing it back to that person, what you're doing is you're giving yourself an opportunity to cool down before you give a response to them. Because if they say something, you say something back, and then it grows and grows and gets heated further. And very likely, inevitably, you will say or do something that you wish you wouldn't have. But by actually listening to what they're saying, forcing yourself to think about it, hear it, and then say it back to them, that gives you an opportunity to think before you say something or do something. It gives you an opportunity to perhaps cool down before you just said that thing that, you know, offhanded or whatever it was, because it forces you to stop and think and say it back to them, which is, you know, maybe a unintended effect or a purposeful effect of active listening in those moments for those people that can do this correctly, but certainly can help in those instances from saying or doing something that you wish you wouldn't have otherwise done because you're not just going back. You say something, I say something, you say something, and it gets faster and faster and, and more angry or, or heated or whatever because I have to listen to what you say. I have to dissect it, understand it, and then give it back to you. And then you have the opportunity to say yes, no, or otherwise. And then I can have a rebuttal after that, which then gives me, again, just that little bit of clarity, that little bit of time in between whatever else I would have I would have said, which is, you know, again, perhaps a unintended side effect or a, a factual byproduct, a purposeful byproduct to being an active listener in a conflict. But either way, I think is very helpful. And if your goal really is to get to the root cause of the argument, resolve it, and, you know, kind of come out on the other side peacefully, not listening to them is going to put you in a terrible position because you're never going to figure out what's wrong. And literally when they're talking to you, they're giving you the keys and the answers to 
hey, why are you so upset? Why are we in this conversation right now? Why are we fighting about this? They're giving you the answers and they're giving you the clues and they're telling you what the root cause is so you can try to resolve that conflict. And if you're not actively listening, digesting, processing, rephrasing, feeding back to them the things that they're saying and really thinking about it, then you're not listening. You're waiting for your turn to yell back at them. You're waiting for your turn to get a slight in or to you know, try to hurt someone's feelings. And like you said, I, I like that it forces you to slow down and really process through it rather than just fight back and forth and spit words at each other because that's not going to get you any closer to your goal of understanding what's wrong. But being able to actually slow down and listen is going to help you get closer to that. And, you know, as difficult as it may be in the middle of a conflict, that's really going to help you achieve the end that you want. Um, it may not be easy. It can be difficult to slow down and listen and try to dissect what's going on. But it's going to get you a whole lot farther than just waiting for your turn to throw something back at that person. And, you know, I think a part of this is having empathy and compassion, which I think, you know, of course, are essential qualities when you're trying to resolve a conflict. A key to the importance is putting yourself in the other person's shoes and seeking to understand their feelings and needs. Empathy can build bridges and create con um, conductive environment for conflict resolution. And, if, and I've, I've heard this said a handful of times, and, and I think this is key here, to seek first to understand and then to be understood. And really that is, is, is that pretty well sums up active listening, right? And, and not only active listening, but ap, uh, active listening with empathy and compassion to seek first to understand, understand what that person is saying, understand what they're trying to communicate to you in whatever way they're doing it. And then to be understood, not the other way around, understand what they're saying and then let them understand you. I think that is really key in keeping empathy and compassion as the the cornerstone in conflict resolution. And that approach does take a lot of humility and patience and persistence because I think we all want to be right regardless of what that means for someone else. And so being able to put your empathy and compassion to the forefront is... is Again, another thing that's not always easy, but it's going to put you in a better position to kind of resolve those conflicts. And I think practicing those two things will make you a better person all around. But speaking of conflict resolution, it's definitely a way to put yourself, put the best foot forward and then really work to achieve uh, a, a desirable end to that conflict. And of course, the other side of empathy and compassion is being assertive, which I think is in conflict resolution is something that is is, necess is is a necessity. So being assertive in conflict resolution means that you are expressing your needs and boundaries while respecting the other person's perspectives. Assertiveness can lead to a mutually beneficial resolution. It's important to communicate assertively without becoming aggressive or passive. There's a... There's a um, a lie, a, a line to toe there in between those two, not becoming too aggressive, also not being passive. You have to be assertive as you're communicating. One way that you can do this is by keeping your ego in check. Of course, it's easier said than done, but try not to be too aggressive, right? Again, being assertive in contract resolution means that you're expressing your needs and boundaries while respecting the other person's perspectives. And the reason this is so important is because if you are letting someone encroach on your boundaries and not respect you because you're just trying to resolve the conflict, it's just going to create more conflict because you are not actually coming to a conclusion that's beneficial to both of you. And finding common ground is key when you're reaching a compromise. So, you know, sometimes identifying interest and goals that are shared between the two of you will build that win-win solution. Um, trying to find a uh, conflict in that common ground, maybe as simple as people, both of you just wanting to walk away with a, a good feeling. You know, that collaboration can lead to the resolutions that satisfy everybody. And so, again, tying that back into your assertiveness. I don't, sometimes hearing that phrase, maybe you could imagine someone being aggressive and pushy. But part of it, like you said, is, is with, without becoming aggressive. And on the flip side, not becoming passives, not just rolling over and saying, okay, fine, whatever you say, just let's just get this done with. 
that's not really what you want. It's going to lead to more conflict in the future. And so being able to be a sort of express your your boundaries, your needs, uh, and respecting the other person when they do express those things to you is going to be a huge part of it. And not only ending the conflict, finding a resolution, but then showing the other person that you do respect them and you do care about what's important to them. You care about the things that matter to them and, and how they're feeling in that situation too. And that's not only going to help you to resolve that conflict, but I would think it's going to help deepen your relationship with that person because that's built on that mutual respect and trust in each other. You know, I think when I think of assertiveness, I think of, of not being a doormat to somebody, not to, not to crumble because somebody said something that, that upset me, but rather to hold my ground on what I believe is, is true and right or, or, you know, I stand firm in what, what I believe in and then communicate with that with the person. Uh, if they choose to believe or accept it, okay, fine, that'd be great. But if not, then, okay, then we have something else to talk about. But I don't want to, if again, if I'm not assertive, to me, assertive is is being firm. And if I'm not firm or assertive in those situations, then I am at the will of everybody else. I'm doing what everybody else wants me to do or say or, or, or even believe because I don't have any belief of my own. And so being assertive uh, for me, again, is, is being able to stand firm in what I believe. Now, maybe I don't believe a lot of things or maybe you don't believe a lot of things. Okay, fine. But you have to have one or two things that you stand firm in and don't wave on those things. Stand firm on those. Stand your ground. And if somebody says something, don't back down. If that's what you believe, tell them that's what you believe. In no uncertain terms, this is it. This is why. This is why I know this to be true. And stand stand that ground. I, and again, assertive, I, I understand what you mean by assertive can be heard as aggressive. But I don't think they're they're mutually, uh, they're, not, they're not the same. Those are close words, but not the same. Especially when we're, we're dealing with conflict. And if you are the type of person that is not assertive, then everybody else is pulling your strings everybody because you are their puppet everybody else is telling you to do this or do that or you know if you but if you're assertive if you can stand up for what you believe in then you get to pull your own strings no i'm not going to do this because of you know this i my this is my boundary and i'm not passing that you don't have that that line in the sand or in stone or whatever and don't go past that have the boundary there that all is with assertiveness. And, you know, that is, I think, again, I, th I think assertiveness really gets a bad rap because it's, uh, people hear assertiveness and they, they think aggressive, angry, yelling, you know, but it's not that. It's, it, being assertive is, is having beliefs and standing, uh, standing strong on those. Set the boundaries. Don't go past this or that. Or, you know, if you don't have those things, those are the people that are working late into the long hours of the night because their boss asked them and they don't know how to say no. So they just say, yeah, I'll show up. I'll show up. I, you know, they have to tell their wife or kids that they won't be home for dinner again because their boss needs them, but because they can't say no to the boss or whatever the situation is, but stand firm on those boundaries. Don't, don't let them waver or, or don't, don't be somebody else's puppet, be your own puppet, be your own, be, be the own puppet master. You know, control yourself, cut the strings. I, you know, I don't, I keep using the puppet thing. <laughs> um, but assertiveness, again, I think it gets a bad rap a lot, but I think people need to be more assertive in every, pretty well every aspect of, of everybody across the board because everybody is so, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't really know. They just, they just go along with everybody else is, is saying or doing um, because they're not assertive. They're not assertive enough. They're not, they're not. They don't have the ability to say no when they really need to say no because they have nothing else. And I, th I think a big part of people not being assertive too is, is they're afraid of being seen as mean or not helpful or rude. Or not liked by those people. Because you didn't stay an extra six hours after you already worked 12. I mean, that's an extreme example there too. But I, I mean, I understand and I see that perspective of not wanting to be viewed that way by other people. But on the other hand, I think I would and I do respect someone more who has boundaries and stands up for themselves and stays true to 
what's important to them. Um, and I think that says a lot more about you as a person than it does if you are just constantly rolling over and doing things. I, you know, I, I do respect and appreciate people who take other others' opinions and feelings into consideration, but when that becomes your sole motivation for everything in your life is what other people think about you, I think you're a little lost in, in what's actually important. And so, well, and I think loss is the key because if they're non-assertive, so like if they're, if, if they're assertive, they have boundaries, if they're firm, then they're like stone, they're rigid. I mean, maybe that's a, a weird analogy, but they're, they're rigid. But if they're, they're going on everybody emotions and, and they're saying and doing what other people say and believe, then they're like Plato and they can be shaped and molded into this one day and then this the next day and, and so on. Um, I, yeah, I, I absolutely, yeah, I agree. I, I just tried to put it out a different way, but yeah. Yeah. So getting get back into kind of the conflicts here, you know, everyone knows, like we mentioned earlier, when you're in a conflict, emotions can definitely run high and that can make finding a resolution into a big challenge. So when we're in these situations, in these conflicts, we need to find a way to manage our emotions to stay composed during those conflicts and those tense situations. So uh, just rapid fire, if you could, do you have some techniques for de-escalating conflicts, keeping the focus on actually finding a solution that's good for everybody? Sure. You know, move to a private area. You, you don't want a, a conflict to be in an open public area. That's just going to make more eyes. It's going to be more pressure. Move to a private area. Respect personal space. That's a, that should be an obvious one, but there's another one. Okay, another one is keep your tone and body language neutral. We already did a whole episode about body language, but being able to have a neutral body language, not to convey too much emotion through your body. Avoid overreaching. Focus on thoughts and feelings. Uh, sorry, focus on, on thoughts and the feelings behind the things that you're saying. Ignore challenging questions. So don't don't try to give challenging questions in those situations. And of course, set boundaries. I think those are those are some key tips to to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, conflict resolution is another valuable skill that can help us to become more effective communicators. It can really transform our relationships and lead to positive outcomes when we're in these situations, you know. Practicing our act of listening, uh, employing our empathy, being assertive for things that are important to us, and trying to find a common ground, getting to the root of the argument. And, you know, all of that can help us to master our conflict resolution, which in turn can, again, make us better communicators across the board. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Join us next time as we continue our journey on the art of com effective communication. Thank you for tuning in to the Prestigious Initiative. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the Prestigious Initiative on your favorite podcast platform. Stay connected to us, with us rather, on all the social platforms. And with those, you can enjoy insightful discussions and practical tips. Remember, conflict resolution is a pathway to building stronger connections creating and creating a harmonious environment. Until next time, communicate effectively and resolve conflicts with compassion and understanding.